In this video, we're going to review CMOS two-stage operational amplifiers. Now, if we're interested in two-stage op amp, it's good to keep in mind a basic premise that the reason we're interested in a two-stage op amp, that is connecting two gain stages in series, is probably because the DC gain from a single stage is insufficient to provide the desired accuracy. As we'll see, introducing this second stage in series can present significant problems in ensuring the feedback loops around this op amp remain stable with sufficient phase margin. So, you know, there are drawbacks to having two stages in series. So really, in general, we consider it only when it's, it's necessary for some other reason. And one main reason would be that there's simply not enough DC gain available from a single stage. A second uh, important reason for using two-stage op amps is when we require wide output swing. So in single-stage amplifiers such as the folded cascode amplifier, we achieve gain by ensuring a very, very large small signal output resistance. And our main technique for doing that is by introducing cascode transistors, which limit the signal swing available at the output because as soon as you have cascoding, you have to allow an extra V effective for those cascode transistors to remain in active mode. On the other hand, with a two-stage op amp, each of the two stages in series can be relatively simple stages. So in particular, the output stage need not have cascoding, and that gives us some extra room for wide output swing. So that's another reason why two-stage op amps are of interest. Classic two-stage op-amp comprises a differential input gain stage, often a simple actively loaded differential pair, followed by a common source second stage. There's the option here to have a unity gain output buffer stage um, to provide a low output impedance, but it's not always necessary since even with a high output impedance, the op-amp can drive capacitive and even some resistive loads with feedback, since shunt feedback will reduce the output impedance of the closed loop amplifier. And again, it's called a two stage op amp because two gain stages, not including the optional unity gain buffer, are connected in series so that the overall gain through the amplifier is the product of the two gain stages, A1 times A2 in this case. Just quickly review the low frequency small signal analysis of the two stage op amp. Here's an example two stage op amp with a PMOS input pair and NMOS common source stage as the second stage. There's no source follower included here. The actively loaded diff pair has a small signal low frequency gain of GM1, the input pair transistors transconductance times the output resistance of the actively loaded diff pair, that's RDS2 in parallel with RDS4. The common source second stage has uh, an output resistance of RDS6 in parallel with RDS7, and that's being driven by the small signal transconductance of Q7, GM7. So each stage has a gain of approximately half of a GM times an RDS, and you cascade two of them in series and you start having an overall gain that's something like add gm rds squared and there's a factor of a half in here as well just to get a feel for the order of magnitude of the gain here and you'll see right away that this is comparable to a full casco folded cascode amplifier but again, in this case, we've used a simple common source second stage, which affords us wider voltage swing at the output than is possible using uh, a folded cascode gain stage, where we'd have extra cascode transistors that need to be kept in active mode. Now, as with the single stage op amp, we'll first consider the first order analysis of the two stage op amp. And then we'll proceed to think about where the second and higher frequency poles may be coming from. 
Now, it may seem a little strange to do a first order analysis of a two stage amplifier. After all, you know, by definition, a two stage amplifier really has two nodes with high impedance that are being used to create two gain stages. But, you know, there's typically a capacitor CC introduced around the second stage, um, which has a Miller effect acting on it and therefore appears like a very large capacitance acting on the output of the first stage. This capacitor CC is typically introduced intentionally to create a dominant pole at the output of the first stage and thereby ensure sufficient phase margin. We'll also see later that introducing this capacitor also actually has a beneficial effect on the second pole frequency of the amplifier. In any case, the Miller effect dictates that the equivalent capacitance at the output of the first stage is equal to the compensation capacitor CC times one plus the gain of the sec common source second stage. Uh, assuming that that gain is much larger in unity, we can just approximate that by saying that the equivalent Miller capacitance at the output of the first stage is CC times the gain of the second stage. And the time constant associated with this node therefore becomes this equivalent capacitance times the output, small signal output resistance of the diff pair stage, which is RDS2 in parallel with RDS4. And we know this input diff pair can be modeled with a small signal equivalent, something like this. And uh, of course, it's got its output resistance, but it's driving this very, very large equivalent capacitance CEQ here. So there's our model for the first stage. Um, now, at all but very, very low frequencies, the impedance presented by CEQ is going to be a lot less than the output of the diff pair stage. So we can neglect that again at all, but very, very low frequencies. And then um, that tells us that the frequency response of this stage is simply GM1 times one over S C E Q. Now substituting in C E Q equals C C times A V two, you get this uh, expression here in the red box. The overall gain of the amplifier, the two stage amplifier, is this gain of the first stage. times the gain of the second stage, AV2. And um, so you get then an interesting cancellation of AV2 in the numerator and the denominator. And then the result is this very simple expression shown here, GM1 over SCC. Um, so again, that looks like an integrator, but that's because it's not valid at very, very low frequencies where we would have to then consider RDS2 in parallel with RDS4 here in the small signal analysis, but um, at frequencies above that very, very low frequency dominant pole, then we've got um, this response here. And then this is quite, this expression here is quite reminiscent of um, the expression for the first order approximation of the response of, say, a folded cascode uh, op amp. which we saw was GM1 over SCL. So the difference here is that um, rather than the frequency response being limited by the load cap, in the two-stage op amp, the frequency response is limited by the value of this compensation capacitor. So again, the first order model for the two-stage op amp 
gives rise to a frequency response like this. Let's write it in terms of omega. Um, we captured this sort of integrating part of the response. So this expression is gm1 over omega cc. Now we know that at low frequencies, it's going to flatten out here. But really what we're probably interested in is this unity gain frequency, since that's going to be related to the bandwidth of any closed loop amplifiers that we use the op amp in. Now, uh, we can easily solve for omega TA by equating this expression here with unity and rearranging and solving for omega. And that gives simply uh, the expression shown here. That is the unity gain frequency of the two-stage op amp is approximately GM1 over CC with this first order model. Uh, assuming a square law for the input pair transistors, we can replace GM1 with the square law expression 2ID over V effective. And uh, finally, we recognize that 2 times ID1 is just equal to the tail current, the tail bias current ID5 over V effective of the input pair transistors and CC. Again, just a reminder that this is the unity gain frequency of the amplifier on its own, as indicated by the subscript A here. If this is placed in a feedback loop, the unity gain frequency of the loop will also depend and will include the factor, the feedback factor beta. So here's an example two-stage op-amp that can be analyzed. You see that the bias current 20 milliamps establishes all the bias currents in the circuit, specifically the current mirror formed by Q8 and Q5 has a ratio of 10, so that ID5 is equal to 10 times 20 microamps or 200 microamps, which means that the bias current in each of Q1 through Q4 is equal to half of that 200 microamps or 100 microamps. Knowing that um, bias current flowing in the diff pair transistors, we can then use a square law equation to find the transconductance of the input pair transistors in terms of some technology parameters, mu p and c ox, and its sizing, w over l, uh, for the value specified in this problem. It turns out that the input pair transconductance is 1.3 milliamps per volt, and you're also given the value of this compensation capacitor CC, one picofarad. So um, with GM1 and CC, we can find the unity gain frequency of uh, the op amp. The second order analysis of the two stage op amp is particularly important again because it does have a second pole uh, due to um, a, a second high impedance node in the circuit. So it's quite likely that we need to consider the second pole frequency in two-stage op amp uh, and compensate it properly. So shown here is an equivalent small signal circuit for the two-stage op amp. The input pair here is simply represented by uh, the transconductance GM1, small signal transconductance of the input pair, and R1, which is the output resistance of the actively loaded input diff pair. You've also got a capacitance C1 that captures all the parasitics connected at the output of the diff pair stage uh, and ground. Then you've got the second common source stage here. Um, transistor Q7 is the common source NMOS transistor. It has a small signal transconductance GM7. Uh, and then you've got the output resistance of the common source stage, which is just two RDSs in parallel, the two output transistors. And then finally, you've got the capacitance of the output node, which is the sum of some parasitics and also the load being driven. Finally, you've got these, the compensation capacitor CC, and uh, in series with that, a resistance RC that we've neglected until now, 
but will become important later in our discussion. But for now, let's just consider the circuit neglecting RC, that is, assuming RC equals zero. So neglecting RC, we just replace it with a short circuit and um, a detailed analysis of the resulting linearized small signal schematic would reveal a second order transfer functions with two poles and uh, a zero. So the detailed blow blood bow analysis is not very instructive. Um, you can refer to textbook to see that analysis carried out, but instead let's focus on the results of that analysis and the intuition that falls out of it. First of all, it's not hard to see the DC gain uh, can be found just by assuming the capacitors are open circuits, which they are at DC, and you would just get the gain of GM1 times R1 times the DC gain of the second stage, GM7 times R2. So um, there you have that expression for DC gain. And as we hoped, we've got a series combination of two gain stages, so that can give us a large DC gain. Um, there's also a, a right half plane zero that falls from a rigorous analysis. It arises at um, a right half plane frequency of GM7 over CC. Zeros, uh, you know, the intuition here is that zeros are not uncommon when you have a capacitor that bridges between two gain stages. And you know, the, the intuition there is that if you go to a high enough frequency, CC starts acting like a short circuit. So when that happens, effectively what's happening is you've taken two first order networks and you've shorted them together to create it just one single RC network. Um, so, you know, in other words, at a high enough frequency, the bridging cap CC makes the second order network into a first order network. And that's kind of what a zero does, right? We know that a zero um, can take a frequency response that's rolling off with a slope of 40 dB per decade and put a little kink in it and cause it to roll off at only 20 dB per decade. So, you know, therefore, you know, beyond that zero frequency, the frequency response starts looking like that of a first order network now, even though it's really a second order network. So that's the effect of a zero. And that is the effect of a bridging cap too, because it, it shorts out nodes and reduces, it sort of at high frequencies looks like the order of the network's been reduced by one. So that's just a good intuition to have in mind because you may see this effect pop up uh, in more complicated circuits as well. Whenever you have a cap that bridges uh, kind of bypasses a gain stage, then you will often see that a rigorous analysis would, would reveal a zero in the frequency response. Now, the rigorous analysis also reveals a dominant pole uh, at a frequency approximated by this expression here. It's a fairly complex expression, but if you uh, zoom in on it a bit, you will quickly recognize that it's quite likely that this term here is likely to dominate because it's a relatively large capacitance CC here multiplied by um, the gain of the second stage GM7 times R2. So in fact, though hi those highlighted terms are nothing more than the CEQ, Miller capacitance, CC times GM7R2. So, you know, not surprisingly, the dominant pole is well approximated by um, simply CEQ times R1. Finally, a rigorous analysis also reveals a second pole 
that arises at the output node. Um, and this ex the expression for the second pole frequency is uh, approximated here. And again, you see it's, it's fairly complex, but um, it's most likely that the dominant terms are those related to CC here, so that we can neglect this term. And then in doing so, uh, because C1 and C2 are only arising due to parasitics, whereas CC is an explicit capacitance that we've introduced. Um, so and and in neglecting that term now it makes it possible to cancel out cc and give us this a uh, very simple expression shown here so this expression is interesting because although the output node uh, has at low frequencies a high impedance rds 6 in parallel with RDS7, and yet the pole that appears related to this output node doesn't include that a large output resistance R out. Instead, it looks like a time constant formed by the parallel combination of C1 and C2 and a diode connected Q7, one over GM7. So the intuition behind this is that at the relatively high frequencies where omega P2 arises, CC is a large enough capacitance that it acts like a short. Now, remembering that for the time being, we're neglecting RC, we're assuming RC is zero. So what it means is that at frequencies up around omega p2, q7 is in fact diode connected, and c1 and c2 are in fact appearing in parallel with each other. So you know, in that light, this time constant, one over gm7 times c1 plus c2, makes perfect sense. So it's an interesting fact that introducing the capacitor CC not only at, serves to create a Miller capacitance at the output of the first stage, which makes it that pole dominant, but it also actually increases the pole that arises at the output by, you know, kind of introducing this high frequency diode connection around Q7 and therefore introducing a small signal resistance of one over GM7 at the output node. Um, so for that reason, we often refer to the compensating capacitor CC as a pole splitting capacitor. It has the effect of taking the pole at the output of the first stage and making it more dominant, shifting it to lower frequencies, and taking the pole that arises at the output stage and shifting it up to higher frequencies. So it sort of splits the two poles apart. And this is really excellent because in all the circuits we've seen so far, it's actually quite difficult to increase the second pole frequency. Usually the only ways of doing it were by pumping more power into the circuit. Um, there were, there were, we had limited flexibility to play with omega P2 by sizing transistors, but here, you know, in this case, the two-stage op amp, introducing that compensation capacitor actually uh, increases the second pole frequency significantly. So now let's summarize the frequency response analysis of the two-stage op amp. We've got the dominant pole at the output of the first stage, where we see the Miller capacitance showing up explicitly CC times the gain of the second stage, GM7 times R2. Um, and then we've got the equivalent second pole, which is arising at the output, where at high frequencies, it looks like C1 and C2 are appearing in parallel with the small signal diode connected, uh, one over GM7. So there's the second pole there. Now we saw a... Uh, 
zero introduced by the bridging cap CC. It turns out if we include the resistor RC in our analysis, it shifts the location of the zero. And in fact, can bring it into um, the left half plane, which will be very useful since then it provides lead compensation. And that's actually the reason why we explicitly go and include RC. It's to take this right half, the right half plane zero, which would otherwise be there and push it into the left half plane and allow it to provide some lead compensation. Um, finally, if we assume a large phase margin, then a first order model is applicable. And we've got this expression for the approximate unity gain frequency, the op amp GM1 over CDC. So next, let's just discuss a few high-level considerations in the design of a two-stage op-amp. First consideration might be whether to select an N-channel or P-channel input stage. Um, now, first and foremost, your consideration might be based on the common mode level that you have to accommodate at the input. Generally, an N-channel input stage allows for a higher common mode level at the input whereas a P-channel input stage allows for a lower common mode or accommodates and really only works for a lower common mode level at the input. So your choice of whether to use an N-type or P-type input stage might be completely dictated just based on the common mode level that you have to accommodate. But if you do have flexibility beyond that to, to make a choice, then you can start taking some of these other considerations into account. First of all, um, in a lot of technologies, the carrier mobility for electrons is higher than that of holes. And so in such cases, all else being equal, the n-channel input stage will provide a greater transconductance for the input diff pair transistors. So this, as we know, will tend to increase the unity gain frequency, omega TA, and thereby increase the bandwidth of a closed loop amplifier if and as long as the second pole frequency is high enough that we don't have to um, worry about phase margin. Um, so for example, if the load capacitance that contributes to C2 is very small um, and you have a fair bit of power to burn so that your GMs are large, especially GM7, then um, this may be the case. Uh, and an n-channel input would be desirable. On the other hand, a p-channel input means an n-channel second stage which therefore means that gm7 is likely to be larger this will tend to increase the second pole frequency so when that's limiting your bandwidth when the second pole is limiting your bandwidth then a p-channel input may allow for a uh, higher second pole frequency and therefore by a higher compensated uh, bandwidth for the amplifier um, an n-channel input stage may, uh, again, because it has larger GM1, may lead to less input referred high frequency noise uh, because thermal noise currents are input referred by dividing by the input pair transconductance, GM1 squared. On the other hand, PMOS devices tend to have lower flicker noise constants than NMOS transistors. So again, all else being equal, a PMOS input stage will have less low frequency noise than an NMOS input stage. So it depends whether you know your um, whether the bandwidth of your amplifier and your signals is low or high, whether the noise performance will be better with a P channel or N channel input stage. Let's next consider the slew rate of the two stage op amp. So again. We analyze the slew rate of an op amp by considering an input transient that's large enough so that all of the tail current is directed to one side of the input diff pair. So for example, let's consider a large positive voltage transient so that all of the drain current, ID5, is directed um, through Q2. Actually, that would be the case for a negative uh, differential voltage transient at the input. So let's consider that. Um, and 
at the same time, Q1 would be turned off because all the current from the tail current source is flowing through Q2. So if there's no current flowing in Q1, there's also no current flowing in Q3, which means there's no current flowing in Q4 since they form a current mirror. So all of the drain current from Q5 has all got to go this way. Um, and really, there's nowhere for it to go but through CC to ground, which will cause um, the capacitance, the voltage on the capacitor CC to be charged up at a rate of ID5. over CC. Now since the voltage at these two nodes are related by the gain of the second stage, then um, this change in the voltage across CC would arise primarily due to a decrease in the output node voltage. So essentially the output node voltage would drop at this rate and that's then the negative slew rate of this two-stage op amp. Um, while that's happening, note that the transistor Q7 would also have to source all of the bias current from Q6, as well as whatever current would have to be drawn from any load capacitance CL in order to allow V out to decrease at that slew rate. So there'd be, during this slewing, there'd be a lot of current being sourced by Q7. Um, so that's going in the negative direction. Let's now then consider what happens when there's a positive transient applied to the differential input. So in that case, um, Q2 would be off. All of ID5 would flow through Q1. That would then get mirrored to Q4. And um, it would flow like this from uh, ID6. So there's a couple cases to consider. What happens when ID5 is greater than ID6? And what happens when ID6 is greater than ID5? Now. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's really, you know, the second pole that's limiting the overall bandwidth of the circuit. Uh, and when the second pole is limiting you, that encourages you to push a larger fraction of the current to the second stage because increasing the drain current in the second stage transistors will tend to increase GM7, which is uh, proportional to the second pole frequency. So when the second pole frequency is limiting you, as is often the case in two-stage op-amp, you're probably going to burn more of the current in the second second stage. So then in that case, it means ID6 is greater than ID5. So even when you're slewing, there's still a little bit of current left from ID6 to go down here through Q7 and keep it in active mode. When that's not the case, if you have ID5 actually greater than, equal or, or greater than ID6, then you have a problem because when you're in slew rate limiting in this direction, there's essentially no current left to flow through Q7 and keep it turned on. So then you can get some strange bias points uh, happening, strange transients happening, and the slew rate is reduced somewhat compared to uh, the analysis here. But uh, again, that's all the more reason why it's more typical case that uh, ID6 is greater than ID5. So in this case, uh, with positive slewing, you've got the capacitor CC being charged up um, with the polarity shown here at, a, again, the same rate as before, ID5 over CC. So you've got the same slew rate in the positive direction as you had in the negative direction. And again, here, ID6 has to uh, supply also some current to the load cap to charge it up at that rate. So uh, given this expression here for the slew rate, 
you notice that ID5 is equal to 2 times ID1. And then you'll also, we're also going to make use of a couple of other facts. Uh, one is assuming a square law model. We've got um, GM1 V effective 1 equals 2 ID1. That's a square law equation that we can substitute in here. And then we can also substitute in the fact that um, G m1 equals omega t a times c c right so we can take this substitute that in here substitute that back in here and uh, we'll then be able to cancel the cc's and arrive at the expression shown here on the right it's an interesting simple expression that shows the slew rate equals v effective of the unprepared transistors times the unity gain frequency of the op-amp. So this, um, again, is reminiscent of a result that we saw for the folded cascode op-amp, where we see that if we want to increase the slew rate without touching the op-amp's unity gain frequency or bandwidth, then what we need to do is actually bias the unprepared transistor with a higher V effective. Slew rate, again, is pretty much the only thing that gets better when you bias the unprepared transistors with a high V effective. Um, most of the other uh, parameters that we care about are, are, are most likely going to get better with a low value of V effective for the unprepared transistors. It's noise performance, it's unity gain bandwidth, um, and so on. So if we consider a scenario where we have a two-stage op-amp that meets all our requirements, except that it has insufficient slew rate, you've got a couple of avenues open to you. First, you can increase the effect of the input pair transistors. You can do that either by increasing their bias current while keeping their size the same, and or you can decrease their W over L ratio. So doing so will uh, improve the slew rate, but will decrease the DC gain. Um, you also will need to recompensate the amplifier to keep omega TA the same and to keep the same phase margin, and you would do so by reducing the compensation capacitor CC. Because otherwise, the increased V effective would uh, cause omega TA to decrease. The other possibility, if um, you're allowed to increase the power consumption of the op-amp, if the spec allows you to do so, then uh, you might use that extra power consumption to increase the bias currents in the second stage of the op-amp, and thereby increasing GM7, and which in turn would increase the second pole frequency, omega P2. Doing so, you can then, uh, you know, you've increased the second pole frequency, so then you can increase the unity gain frequency of the op-amp by decreasing CC while keeping the same phase margin. Decreasing CC, and you and in doing all this, you've kept the input bias currents the same, will therefore give you the increase in slew rate that you're after. So this is sort of like a win-win. You're increasing the bandwidth of the op-amp by increasing the second pole frequency. And in fact, by decreasing the compensation capacitor, all, quite often that compensation capacitor is one of the physically one of the largest components in the integrated circuit. So you're probably also reducing the area of the circuit. Um, so it really increases a lot of aspects of the up and performance, except that you've now, you know, in order to get the, these benefits, you've had to burn more power. So once again, we see that burning more power uh, in the right place can allow you to improve many things uh, in the op -amp. It's important to point out here that the transistors in the two-stage op-amp have to be sized properly in order to avoid systematic uh, offset. So um, to see this, you can recognize that just by looking at this input pair transistor, there's only going to be zero offset if when you've got zero differential input, the current 
from Q5 is split equally between the two halves of the diff pair circuit. Now, that in turn will only be the case if the drain voltages of Q1 and Q2 are the same, right? They, with zero differential input, they will clearly have the same value of VGS, but for them to carry the same current, they should also have the same values of VDS. So how do we ensure that the drain current here is at the exact same voltage as the drain current there? Well, the drain current here is set by um, the gate source voltage of Q7. So um, if Q7's current density is the same as the current density of Q3, then they will have the same VGS, and then the input pair transistors will be uh, see the same drain source voltages. So that's the criteria we need to ensure, ensure that the current density of Q3 is the same as that of Q7. So how do we do that? Well, in this particular schematic, we see that 20 microamps is mirrored over here, becomes 200 microamps, which becomes 100 microamps flowing in Q3. Whereas the current mirror ratio between Q8 and Q6 um, tells us that we've got 300 microamps flowing down here through Q7. So the drain current through Q7 is triple what it is in Q3 but its W over L ratio, as indicated by these numbers here, is also triple that of Q3. So therefore they've got the same uh, current density. And uh, so all, you know, the, the nice steady state operating point would arise with VGS3 being the same as VGS7. Um, we can, uh, define this criteria for systematic offset uh, analytically in terms of the W over L ratios of the transistors. So essentially the ratio of these two transistors is related to the ratio of these two transistors to ensure that Q3 and Q7 are biased to the same current density. Finally, I just want to point out that although um, the sort of simple two-stage op map that we've talked about so far has a simple actively loaded diff pair as its input stage, it's also possible to use a more complex stage for the first stage of a two-stage op map. This may be desirable if even the gain from the simple two-stage op map we presented so far is insufficient. So shown here is a popular variant of the two-stage op-amp where the first stage is actually a folded cascode stage. Um, this obviously gives the first stage more gain than the simple actively loaded diff pair. Um, and it doesn't cause any problem. The limited swing at the output of the cascode stage causes no problem because it's the output stage that has to provide the output swing. Uh, and the swing therefore that has to be accommodated here is the output swing divided by the gain of the common source stage. So if the common source stage say has a gain of 10 and the output swing is one volt peak to peak, then it means that the first stage only has to provide an output swing of 100 millivolts peak to peak. Um, so again, the, the first stage doesn't need to have a wide output swing. We can take advantage of cascoding, therefore, to get more gain from the first stage. This is still, uh, in principle, only a two-stage op-amp because there's only two high impedance nodes, high small signal resistance nodes in the equivalent half circuit here. One is at the output of the folded cascode, and the other is at the output of the second stage, second common source stage. So, Compensation of this amplifier proceeds just like an ordinary two-stage op amp. It's just that there's an additional third-order pole that's arising 
because of these internal nodes here at the store system to be bring before in this schematic um, that you would want to ensure are significantly higher than the second pole that arises because of the common source second stage. 